is an extremely important topic. Uh, when I was uh, a student, surgical oncology student, this is something which we really lacked. We used to walk every day to pathology department, learn, understand them, read about various stains, uh, how to identify the nuclear future. And uh, it is it's a very important topic, uh, especially now most of the things have actually, you know, uh, have moved here. And only one person I have in mind, that is Professor Dr. Shanta Madam. Uh, she is regarded as one of the best cytopathologists in entire India and among top in the world. I have the honor of, you know, uh, taking her guidance over many, many years. One of the awesome, you know, it is something different to have a full tissue and try to analyze them with a lot of IFC marker. That is not a great art. But just to look at nuclear cytoplasmic features and then come out with fantastic diagnosis which are accurate is a great art skill accumulated over many, many decades like Dr. Shanta Madam has done. She was the ex-professor of pathology and head of cytopathology for many, many years in Tata Medical Hospital, TMH Mumbai. Subsequently, she moved to Bangalore and a lot of top diagnostic services, top cancer hospital. She is the final court of law and destiny. Anywhere you have any doubt, all the slides go to Madam and she would solve us. Thank you very much, Madam, for accepting our invitation. And students, please utilize this opportunity. Every slide is very important. Please keep all your ear, eyes open. Learn as much as possible. Then put relevant questions at the end of Madam's talk in chat box or Q&A section. And we'll try to address them. Thank you very much. Over to you, Madam. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Somshekar, for uh, inviting me to deliver a talk. Teaching is always... Uh, very pleasant activity as far as I'm concerned. And I put this picture of the lamp and we all know how one lamp likes the other. So I will try in this uh, short time to give a brief a brief uh, uh, resume or brief account of uh, the role of cytology in uh, surgical oncology uh, practice. And uh, now you are all familiar with this uh, proverb, you know, in Hindi, which is Nashina Jani Angan Teda, which also in the English equivalent, a bad workman quarrels with his tools. So what happens is when, when the clinician does not know what are the pros and cons of a diagnostic uh, technique, then you see uh, they blame the pathologist and then we become the button of uh, coffee room jokes. So, I therefore want to give you an idea of how to use a technique because everything is how you use a particular technique. Now, what is the difference between cytology and histology? You all know that uh, histology takes, uh, the turnaround time is also uh, longer and you have invasive procedures to obtain tissue with limited options for repeating and the elaborate procedure that is fixation, informal in processing, paraffin embedding, sectioning, staining, etc. And the diagnosis is based on architecture and stromal reaction in addition to cytomorphology. And ancillary testing such as histochemistry, immunohistochemistry are possible. Whereas cytology non-invasive and or minimally invasive can be repeated Technique is simple with less turnaround time. Diagnosis is based largely on cytomorphology. Ancillary testing requires cell block preparation. Sometimes you may see tissue fragments in FNAC, but uh, our diagnosis is based mainly on the cytomorphology. Now, cytology is highly technique dependent. That is very important to remember. Now, this is an old photograph of the staff of the cytology lab in. Uh, EMH. I just put this picture to emphasize the role of the cytotechnologist. The cytotechnologist takes a lot, lot of load off the shoulder of the pathologist. They, in, in TMH lab, they used to prepare their own stains and then they used to do this uh, uh, screening. Especially in exfoliative cytology, screening is very important. So if you have a trained cytotechnologist, the, the results are much better than if you have the pathologist who has very limited training in cytology. So you must know the background of the, of the person to whom you are sending the material. It is always a good idea to have a 
cytotechnologies in your lab because that will avoid a lot of technical issues. Um, so I strongly recommend that if you have a big oncology practice, the role of cytotechnologies is invaluable. Now, how do we, you must be wondering how we just look into the scope and then, you know, come out with some diagnosis. I mean, uh, Dr. Somshaker was giving me too much credit, but uh, it is all uh, reproducible. So once you have had some experience uh, and uh, exposure, it's not too difficult. See, the, the, the understanding is that the normal, uh, normal cells, you know, they, they, divide and uh, in a particular uh, fashion, you know, as, as, as far as the time and other things are concerned. But the malignant cells, they have this property of exfoliation. So we basically use that property of the malignant cell. So therefore you will find in the smears, when it's a malignant uh, region, you will find there is increased cellularity, discohesion, uh, cytomegaly, anisole. So there are many, many of these features which we use either singly or in combination to arrive at a reasonable diagnosis. I will try to illustrate this so that it becomes more understandable. Now this is a drawing, my drawing. So you can excuse me for this uh, poor uh, representation. But you can see that if the top is in normal uh, way cells divide. For example, you have abundant cytoplasm, and you have a small nucleus, and this is a normal cell division. This is a metaphase spindle. Then the nuclei become smaller, and then finally pycnotic, and then there is lysis. Now, in comparison to that, you see the malignant cells are larger. The nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is altered. The chromatin is coarse. You get membrane irregularity. Nucleoli appear. Then you have these altered shapes. So, and then this is, for example, a spindle looking uh, cell. Here is what looks like a tadpole. And you see this abnormal mitosis. This you can say is a tripolar mitosis. And then asymmetrical division. You have a large nucleus and a small nucleus. Sometimes you then get architectural features like what you see here, uh, like a glandular uh, structure. Or this is a broken gland. And this is an irregular gland. Some of that, sometimes you may be able to see that, but these are the main features on which we make a diagnosis of malignancy. Now, what is the inter interface between the uh, surgical oncologist um, and the results that we obtain? See, the, the oncologist, his interface is with the patient and his disease and management, and also the procedure an interpretation of the report. Then, uh, and the cytotechnologist, cytopathologist is the interfaces with the procedure and issue of the reports. So I'm going to focus mostly on this aspect where the surgical oncologist interfaces with this cytology, as far as procedure and interpretation of the report. And for illustrating the point, I will include, of course, cytology images. So we will go to the, what is the physician and surgeon's role? It is the assessing the suitability of the patient for a specific diagnostic procedure, providing accurate demographic data, clinical details, provisional clinical diagnosis, publish imaging findings where relevant, and whether it is a guided or non-guided procedure. The specimen, whether it's sent is either a biopsy, cytology, cell block, etc and understanding and acting on the reports. Now, clinical cytology, I mean, I am trying to compress the whole spectrum in this one hour talk so you can understand that there are limitations. But broadly speaking, gynecologic and non-gynecological cytology, the procedures to obtain material are non-invasive or minimally invasive, useful in both the preventive, that is a pap smear diagnostic and in follow-up to ascertain the recurrences useful in the diagnosis of both oncologic and non-oncologic disease spectrum. The report helps the surgeon in not only selecting the patient for surgery, but also in deciding the extent of surgery. Neg Please remember that uh, negative and inconclusive results are of not much use. 
Now, material for cytology, uh, as I told you, that malignant cells, you know, they, ex they exfoliate spontaneously. Exfoliation means like how the leaves fall off from the tree. So that is that is where the term exfoliative has come from. Then you can use brush cytology, imprint touch, squash cytology. For example, in CNS, you'll find that uh, the squash is preparation is uh, very frequently used. Then you have aspiration cytology, serous effusion, cyst fluids, then lavage, when you ins instill saline and then you uh, withdraw the saline and uh, from there you obtain the cells. And uh, this is particularly applicable in, in uh, pulmonary cytology, for example, bronchial. Esophageal also, uh, because obstruction, uh, uh, esophageal tumors produce obstruction and biopsy may not be easy to obtain. And peritoneal wash uh, cytology for uh, for uh, ovarian malignancies where you have to rule out dissemination. And finally, fine needle aspiration cytology. Now, what are what are the possibilities with cytological material? Now, th this is ROSE, which is rapid on-site evaluation for a certain adequacy. I have had a lot of experience with this, particularly in pulmonary cytology. Then smears for diagnostic evaluation, microbiological evaluation, flow cytometry for suspected lymphoma, and preservation saline, formalin, preservatives for thin prep cell block, immunohistochemistry, especially on cell block preparation, and last but not the least, molecular and cytogenetic testing. I will briefly touch upon the technical aspects, that is the fixatives and stains. We have this uh, wet fixatives, the commonly used ones are 95% ethanol or 100% methanol or a mixture of the two. Commercially available instant dry coating fixatives are, uh, are also used. Then liquid-based cytology for thin prep fixative is supplied by the manufacturer of the equipment. And uh, pap staining is done on wet well, well fixed smears, air dried smears we do MGT that is may involve GIMSA and uh, HND staining. The smears require rehydration with saline before staining. MGG is especially suitable for rheumatological disorders. And the type of stain that we use also, um, the pathologist has to get used to which stain is good for which situation. Other special stains, as and when indicated, uh, manual staining can be done. Now, automatic staining equipments are also now available. Now, this is where the clinician comes. Understanding reports. The pathologists have a habit of writing long winded reports, which doesn't make any sense to the clinician. So, to avoid this, uh, the international uh, societies, they have evolved a system of reporting for both radiology as well as cytology and which more or less are comparable. Originally, in the pap smear, they used five classes. And uh, there's basically the first two are benign. Then middle, we don't know what it is. Then you have some suspicious and malignant. Now, there are other systems which have been uh, introduced uh, for use internationally. And most of you must be familiar with this. Bethesda system for pap smear and thyroid FNAC. Milan system for FNAC of striatic glands the Paris system for urinary cytology, etc. In general, the first two categories are benign. The middle category is inconclusive. The fourth and fifth are suspicious and malignant respectively. And this is similar to that used in radiology like myrax in the breast. Now, gynecological cytology it is a success story of the 20th century for cancer prevention. The pap smear for cervical lesion is the most commonly used cytology in gynecology. Endometrial aspirations can be obtained for cytology, but people sampling and curators provide better material for diagnosis by histology. Cytology is contraindicated for lesions of ovary for fear of upstaging the disease. Serious effusion cytology is useful in the diagnosis of malignant ascites, but sensitivity is not very high. Peritoneal washing cytology at the time of surgery is also common practice to ascertain the presence of tumor dissemination. Now, this man changed the, the scenario in the 
20th century, George Pepe Niccolo. He was a uh, he was a uh, physician from uh, Athens, and he moved to New York. And his initial job was a uh, carpet salesman, and uh, he got a job uh, where he started looking at the vaginal uh, vaginal six meals from guinea pigs, and then he said, "I must look into." The human vaginal smears also. He solicited the help of his own wife, and he used to take smears from uh, his wife's uh, genital tract and observe the uh, various uh, in in the normal menstrual cycle these types of cells which shed. Then he thought it's better to get a wider uh, population, wider population, and he sought the help of a guy called his friend. And he told him that please give me smears from normal looking cervix. And when he saw smears from some of these normal looking cervixes, he found cells which were very different from normal. And that uh, led to his further studies. And then the whole story is actually uh, mentioned in um, Siddharth Mukherjee's book, uh, The Emperor of Melodies. Uh, I'm sure most of you, because you are in this oncology field, must have read it, or if those who have not read, I strongly recommend. It is a fascinating, fascinating account of of uh, the cancer uh, uh, cancer field. Now these are the equipments which are required for gynecological cytology, and I will show you how it is used. The Pap smear technique is a material is obtained from the posterior vaginal fornix. Exocervix and spermocolumnar junction, and the endocervix by using cotton tipped applicator sticks, higher spatula, and the cervix brush. As I said, now this is a speculum in position, and this is a cotton tip applicator, and it is smearing the uh, exocervix. And then it is uh, smeared on the glass slides and then stained. Nowadays, uh, I mean, large centers, they make their own stains, but now these kits are available for rapid pap stains. This is the appearance of cells, normal cells in a vaginal smear. This is actually, a, a, they've taken it from the net. And it shows the spectrum of cells, which you see in a normal vaginal cytology. We have this, what we call superficial intermediate and paravasal cells. Now, these are, this, Red cytoplasm, if you see, this is what we call the eosinophilic cytoplasm. These are in superficial cells, and these are cyanophilic, we call this cyanophilic, and these are intermediate cells, and this one, which looks as a pavement, it is the metaplastic cells. And this is the smaller of the three types, which is the parabasal cells. So mostly, only the superficial intermediate cells, they appear in the smear, very few parabasal cells. If you see too many parabasal cells, uh, you will see it only in postmenopausal patients or during post-pregnancy, you will get this. Otherwise, in other, other uh, age groups, you see, these are the cells which exfoliate and these are the columnar cells which are from the endocervix. Then there are other cells like neutrophils and histiocytes, RBCs, etc., which are really not uh, very, um, and which are universally seen in almost every site. Now, this is the, this is a, the, what you see on the left is just a group of squamous cells, but this is what we call a coelocyte. Now, the coelocyte usually is a, is a squamous cell showing a viral cytopathic effect. And this is the, uh, this we interpret as the uh, uh, HPV infected cell. So what you see is a little enlarged cell with a smudged, smudged chromatin. The smudging of the chromatin means it's a dead cell. It's not a, uh, it's not a live cell. And this, uh, once the cell dies, you know, the virus particles are released and they go and infect other cells. And they, they produce a large cytoplasmic vacuole, which is called cytoplasmic necrosis. And uh, binucleation is also common. 
So you will find that the this is uh, was a very important uh, observation, and uh, this is what led to further uh, studies. And uh, this man, that is Harold Zurhausen, I had also a good fortune to listen to his lecture in in TMH uh, for uh, at some. Uh, I think a uh, 50th uh, year celebration, and he, uh, he was invited. At that time, he was not a Nobel laureate. He had just, uh, uh, because he was observing uh, etiology of uh, uh, cervical cancer, uh, various candidates, including herpes simplex. And uh, he found that uh, uh, vaginal warts and, uh, and thought, uh, everybody knew that warts are caused by papilloma viruses. And he then went on to um, associate the role of HPV infection in cervical cancer. And for this, he was awarded a uh, Nobel Prize in the year 2000, Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2008. Now, HPV testing material can be obtained at the same time as pap smear, and it has to be preserved in a transport medium and sent to molecular testing lab within two weeks of collection. <clears throat> the results indicate whether HPV is detected or not, and also whether it is low or high risk. You must know that not all HPV. <coughs> not all uh, HPV uh, human papillomaviruses are <coughs> high risk. And most commonly, you know, excuse me. So, you know that 16 and 18 is higher risk, and there are other viruses which are low risk. And it is considered to be a better screening option in asymptomatic women. This is a picture of a squamous cell carcinoma in vaginal cytology. You can see, as I was telling you, the alteration of shapes, hyperchromasia, and pleomorphism. Etc. Now, because of the latent period uh, between the HPV contracting HPV infection to invasive carcinoma is a very long period which can range from 0 to 20 years, effective preventive strategies are possible in cervical cancer. And uh, the association of HPV with cervical cancer has led to uh, development of vaccine for, for cervical cancer. Hopefully, in the next uh, in the next few decades, we won't see any HPV-associated cervical cancer. However, in, when these uh, HPV-associated cervical cancers are going down, we will find that non-HPV-associated cervical cancer uh, has, <clears throat> has uh, uh, raised their ugly head. So, Newer and newer classification schemes are now being proposed for these non-HPV associated cervical cancers. Now this is now this is where you uh, have to understand the reports, and uh, I briefly considered this Bethesda system. And the Bethesda system has got uh, uh, three categories: what is the specimen type, conventional, like BC or other, and adequacy and interpretation results. Now, this is uh, negative for intraepithelial lesion, NFIEL stands for negative for intraepithelial lesion malignancy. These include these categories brown neoplastic, reactive cellular changes associated with inflammation, and uh, microorganisms, including fungal, etc. Now, epithelial abnormalities, I will just go to this. Now, these are the various categories of epithelial. Abnormalities. ASCA stands for atypical squamous cells of uncertain significance. ASC H is the uh, atypical squamous cells cannot rule out SIP. Velocidotic changes consistent with HPV and BFT. Low grade 
grades were missing practical English. High grades were missing practical English. It's we cannot do not square myself carcinoma and in this it's square myself carcinoma. Madam, if you want to take a short break and have warm water and come, it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah I'll just do that. Now, uh, we go to pulmonary uh, cytology. Uh, it is a now uh, arena of the interventional pulmonologist. As far as the pulmonary cytology material is concerned, you see, these are the materials which are supplied. That is sputum cytology, bronchial brushing, lavage, bronchiolo alveolar lavage, TBNA for hyalur most. TBNA stands for transbronchial needle aspiration for hyalur lymph nodes and mediastinal masses, transthoracic FNAC for parenchymal lesions, and finally pleural effusion. The sputum cytology has largely gone out of uh, use because of low sensitivity, but it is still useful for, for microbiology and therefore uh, uh, it is currently used. <clears throat> These are the various methods of obtaining. I don't want to go into too many details because it is not really uh, useful in uh, surgical oncology. We used to be, uh, get samples, you know, brief examples and uh, induced sputum using aerosols post bronchoscopy sputum. The sensitivity is low, only about 50%. And uh, recent fiber optic techniques and CT guided biopsies have largely replaced it for the diagnosis of neoplastic lesion. But this is still useful in microbiology. This is a picture of a adenocarcinoma sputum cytology. You can see the embryogenic background and the uh, malignant cells arranged as uh, balls. <coughs> This is a small cell carcinoma. Usually we describe the chromatin as salt and pepper. And there are other features which we use like uh, molding and uh, uh, things like that. Now, now this was a <clears throat> paper. I uh, am the co-author with uh, Dr. Ravindra Mehta. And this was done in the Apollo Hospital and also in Portis where we published our experience with the transbronchial needle aspiration, the title being the original guard who still has a role in biliastinal lymph node sampling. So this is the reference for those of you who would like to look it up. And the report of such TBNA uh, is, uh, is something like this. They obtain uh, from various stations, they label them as uh, 4L, 4R, 11R, S7, and then this is a transbronchial biopsy, and then bronchial wash cytology is also supplied. So this is an example of a, a report um, issued for conventional TBNA TB. And this is a collection of reticuloid histocytes obtained from a medicinal lymph node aspirate, and this is the picture of them for tuberculosis. There is also a reporting system for respiratory cytology, similar to similar to gynec cytology. As I said, non-diagnostic negative for malignancy, atypical, neoplastic, benign or low grade, suspicious for malignancy and malignant. Each diagnostic category is associated with a certain amount of risk of malignancy. And these categories and our own detect the nature of the disease and the management protocol. Now this is actually the title from the thesis of one of my postgraduate students who did the, our experience with pine needle cytology in the lung and mediastinum. And uh, these were the results most of commonly was uh, squamous cell carcinoma and uh, adenocarcinoma and uh, uh, not otherwise uh, carcinoma not otherwise with and uh, uh, other categories as you can see here. And uh, this is the uh, mediastinal uh, fewer cases and most of them was granulomatous inflammation. Now this is a picture <clears throat> from that thesis of thymoma. You can see these larger cells, they have a little degenerate. By degenerate what we mean is you know the chromatin is not very crisp 
and this degeneration can be due to several factors, um, especially technical, because uh, if you allow drying of a smear, then it introduces these uh, degenerative changes in the cells. That is why it's, uh, if you are using wet fixative, you have got to be very prompt when <coughs> you fix the slide. And uh, some dexterity is therefore required. So if you have colleagues who are more dexterous than you are, then maybe you should solicit their help. So these artifacts do come up uh, and they, they, they make it make it our job difficult. Now, gastrointestinal tract cytology, uh, there is a spectrum, uh, oral cytology. I don't think uh, uh, oncologists um, do this very often. Sometimes it is useful, for example, uh, in dermatologic conditions like uh, pemphigus, for example, you can uh, take uh, the fluid and uh, make a smear, and, I mean the blisters in pemphigus. Uh, sometimes you can obtain fluid from that and smear. So it is for cancer, it is not a very ideal uh, situation. At this, I feel uh, it is not a very good option. Esophagus I feel is very important because the lesion, the, the, because of the cancer, there is luminal obstruction and uh, it may not be easy to uh, get biopsy material. And uh, even in biopsies, I use cytology because in the biopsy, if you find that uh, uh, there will always be some necrotic material around. And if the pathologist pays attention to those cells and use psychological features on those cells, very often we can help the uh, clinician. Because what do you do if the clinician, if the esophagus is obstructed? Uh, we, we are left uh, with very little options to confirm diagnosis. And anyway, most of these they undergo radiotherapy, and so you only need a uh, uh, a report of positive for malignancy. As well as stomach, you now you know fiber optic biopsies can visualize the lesion and biopsies can be obtained. So, really speaking, cytology has limited role. So, so, so also up to second part of the genome, fiber optic biopsies can reach, and therefore, uh, biopsy under direct vision is a preferred uh, method of obtaining tissue for diagnosis. Now, pancreas, liver, and biliary tract. Pancreas, again, now needle core biopsies have, uh, uh, in, have replaced the cytology largely, but sometimes a combination of the two uh, can also be helpful. Uh, colon, rectum, anal canal, and all in easily accessible sites, so not much. Uh, now, this is actually uh, FNAC from liver uh, hepatoma, and uh, <clears throat> we need to make a diagnosis based on the appearance of uh, uh, the cells, that is, resemblance to normal hepatocytes, the trabecular arrangement, and sinusoidal investment. You can see this uh, spindly nuclei. These, well, you see it in several sites, and these are actually endothelial cells, uh, which are lining the sinusoids between the uh, trabeculae of hepatocytes. This looks so well differentiated that, uh, you know, uh, we may get worried about committing of ourselves. So histology is <clears throat> useful because we can use uh, histochemistry like uh, reticulin staining. The reticulin staining outlines these trabeculae and uh, in normal liver, the trabeculae are only one cell or maximum in reparative situations, two cell thickness and which will be outlined by the reticulin stain. But if there are say four or five cells uh, in that uh, trabecula, it is, even though it looks very mature and novel, you can make a confident diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, and this is possible in histology. But in cytology also, if it is very cellular, and uh, this kind of, because in uh, non-neoplastic, you hardly get uh, material, and even if you get material, cells will be smaller, and the normal cytoplasmic. Well, there are subtle features which I don't want to go into detail. But uh, as I said, if you have a large mass in the liver and ultrasound guided needle core biopsies may be a better option. <clears throat> Bile duct definitely cytology has a role because it is basically an inaccessible site and uh, not uh, 
approachable for uh, direct vision. So the newer diagnostic procedures, uh, ERCP, then endoscopic ultrasound, if any, all these are available. And the newer thing in the block is this spyglass direct visualization system, which is an addition to the armamentarium. So percutaneous transhepatic approach is used and uh, brushings. And I have had a chance to see a large number of brushings. When you see frankly malignant cells, it is very easy and uh, we can make a confident diagnosis. And uh, so this site is particularly difficult to obtain uh, diagnostic material. Uh, so as we go along, let's see uh, if something else comes up. And brushings have a low sensitivity, but very high specificity for malignancy. And it can detect high-grade biliary tract dysplasia in basic carcinoma, intraepithelial neoplasms, but cannot distinguish in situ from invasive carcinoma. And reactive versus neoplastic may be at times problematic. Ancillary testing. This is the SMAT4 by IHC uh, is used in uh, this pancreatic biliary tract. The benign cells, they retain SMAT4 by IHC. This may therefore be a additional help. <clears throat> this is a pictorial representation. You can see how normal cells, they just are like a honeycomb, flat sheet with distinct cell borders and a very uh, uniform nuclei. Uh, whereas you see here, for example, they start dissociating. That is another feature of malignant cells. Normally, you know, they are very cohesive uh, and uh, tight. Uh, whereas once uh, they become malignant, they lose their um, their uh, property of uh, cohesion. So we, you will find in many cytology reports mentioning of discohesive cells. Discohesive cells because they easily uh, separate from each other. And so this is a, again a diagrammatic representation of something benign to malignant. Approach to diagnosis of pancreatic neoplasms. Now EUS is used for the evaluation of the local extent of pancreatic cancer and the interdefinite diagnosis of cystic lesions of the pancreas. EUS CT guided pineal aspiration biopsy cytology is performed to obtain diagnosis and it is associated with a low complication rate. Now, cytopathology of pancreatic neoplasms. Now, most pancreatic are pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and mostly in the pancreatic head. Other histological types include acinal adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine, solid papillary neoplasm, etc. Diagnosis is straightforward in poorly differentiated carcinoma in cytology, but not so. Uh, in uh, <clears throat> well differentiated tumors. Cytology is most useful in solid pancreatic neoplasm. Diagnosis of carcinoma variants is neither possible nor necessary. However, neuroendocrine tumors can be recognized on cytology. Ancillary studies on cell block preparation is possible. And it's the papnicolo system of reporting similar to other sites. Now, this was a study which we did while I was in PMH. Uh, we did uh, intraoperative fine needle aspiration cytology of pancreas, and we did 97, yeah, 97 cases. And in this study, when non representative cases were excluded, sensitivity is around 90% and specificity 100%. The FNAC was carried out under direct vision from the pancreas, however, for ampullary vision, a transurinal approach was used. You can see the com compare and contrast between normal looking benign uh, glandular cells arranged uh, in a flat sheet. Note the uniformity of the uh, nuclei and some bubbly cytoplasm indicating presence of mucin. And in contrast, you see this group of malignant cells and which show what we call variation size. The term used is anisonucleosis. Then uh, pleomorphism, that means you know, they have different shapes. And then we also look at the chromatin. You can see the chromatin becomes very coarse. Then you see nucleoli. And uh, sometimes you may be able to also see mitosis if the lesion is mitotically very brisk. 
this is a very uh, rewarding, uh, rewarding finding when you come across this entity, which is the, uh, which is now designated as solid pseudoparticular neoplasm of the pancreas, which is typically seen in young females with good outcome. And you see this new, uh, the top picture shows a pseudopapillary pattern. What you see is a, a blood vessel coursing here. And you see very uniform looking cells. And uh, <clears throat> here you can see some mixoid stroma also. The nuclear round to oval centrally placed with bland chromatin. We had a series of uh, cases which we reported in the actor cytological some years ago. Now we come to urinary tract cytology. In various samples which used are voided urine, catheterized urine, urine obtained in cystoscopic evaluation, brushing, lavage, retrograde ascending urethrography and pyelography. Then you have to decide where the cells are coming from, the upper urinary tract, and specimens from neobladder, ileal conduit. Then FNC of kidney, FNC of prostate. FNC of prostate has, of course, been largely replaced by new core biopsies. Now, uh, the sample is uh, used, uh, urine is, it uh, depends on, uh, you know, uh, we do, if there is not much cellularity, then you use centrifugation, cytocentrifugation, use of membrane filters, and as well as staining, that's a PAP staining is used. Now, this is a Paris system for reporting urine cytology. There are four categories. Atypical urothelial cells, suspicious for high grade urothelial carcinoma, high grade urothelial carcinoma, low grade urothelial neoplasia based on presence of 3D papillary clusters with fibrovascular pores, including capillaries. The diagnostic categories 1 to 3 are based on progressive increase in NC ratio and severity of nuclear features, which are assigned as major and minor criteria. The limitation of urine cytology is its suboptimal sensitivity for low grade lesions. And of course, cystoscopic correlation is essential. And these are the ancillary molecular techniques available for urine cytology. Fish and uh, so this system is called the Eurovision. Then immunocytochemistry. Uh, then other tests based on telomerase, fibroglo fibroblast growth factor, etc. I don't have much experience with this. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can just look up this reference. Now, this is an example of a group of malignant cells in urinary cytology. And you can see the hyperchromasia, membrane irregularity, coarsely clumped chromatin. And in this sort of uh, scenario, making a diagnosis of malignancy is not uh, difficult. But when you have very differentiated papillary uh, carcinoma, then uh, it may be difficult. Therefore, when a cytologists look at urinary cytology, it's very important to know how the material is pain. In voided urines, if you see pathology clusters, then you know you are you uh, you are uh, you consider a neoplasm. Whereas if it is a cystoscopic urine, what happens is that the instrument uh, there is an abrasive effect on the mucosa. So some of those uh, mucosal cells get dislodged and they may just fall up and uh, give an appearance that it is a, it is a papillary carcinoma. So that, that becomes very difficult. That is why when you do this uh, retrograde uh, ascending uh, pyelography samples, no, uh, retrograde uh, catheterization samples, uh, this, it is unavoidable because uh, uh, the element of aggressive, uh, aggressiveness is there. Therefore, uh, one has to be very, very careful with uh, urine cytology because that would involve, you know, doing a uh, nephroeurotrectomy, etc. <clears throat> so there are limitations in urine cytology. Now, this is again another thesis my student did, uh, looking at fine needle aspiration cytology of kidney and adrenal gland, uh, 138 cases. And uh, these included adult and pediatric cases, adults were 40 to 50 age group, pediatric cases were mostly below six years. And various diagnostic categories in this material was uh, renal cell carcinoma, adenocortical carcinoma, malignant NOS, 
benign, malignant round cell tumor in West, neuroblastoma, and metastatic. I'll show you some pictures from this thesis. This is from renal cell carcinoma. And, uh, this particular organizing vessel around which some mixoid matrix material is seen. And uh, this is uh, considered quite uh, uh, diagnostic of uh, renal cell carcinoma. What happens on the right side is you have issues with liver, uh, kidney, adrenal. The cytology of all these three, they look very similar. So sometimes, you know, we just say we cannot uh, differentiate between uh, carcinoma arising from the liver and uh, kidney and uh, adrenal. So particularly in the right side, it may be sometimes problematic because if the tumor becomes very, very big, then uh, even on imaging, uh, the, the radiologist finds it problematic to exactly pin the site of origin. So this is something which uh, as a surgical oncologist, we should remember. <coughs> this is an example of a uh, cell block preparation uh, showing tubules. You can see this is a from a Wilms tumor. And uh, this is uh, here, which uh, this blue arrow shows you the blastema. I mean, it, it is, well, this is again a blastemal uh, area from Wilms tumor. There's a lot of matrix material in the background. And this is a neurofibrillary rosette in a neuroblastoma from a pediatric case. Now we come to serious effusion cytology, the technical aspects. The source is usually plural, pericardial, peritoneal, and uh, freshly tapped, tapped samples are preferred. And uh, one has to note down the gross characteristics of the fluid, whether it's clear, straw colored, yellowish, brownish, red, chylus, prevalent, mucoid, hemorrhagic, etc. Direct smear, centrifuge smear, cytocentrifuge smear, saline rehydration technique for hemorrhagic samples are the technical aspects of uh, smear preparation. You can also make cell block preparation for HNE staining and PAP staining can also be done. Now this is an example of the various types of fluids that you may uh, aspirate from these sites. Now a little uh, this thing about source of primary in malignant effusion. If you consider plural and uh, adult females, this is the spectrum breast, ovary, GIT. GIT basically from stomach, directly from esophagus and colon. Then other include lung lymphoma and adult males, lung GIT lymphoma in children, leukemia lymphoma, Wilms neuroblastoma, round cell tumor, etc. On the other hand, ascitic fluid, you can see ovary, breast, GIT lymphoma, and adult males, colon, stomach, pancreas, lymphoma, and this one is the same. Cytology of metastatic malignant serous effusion, metastatic adenocarcinoma, not always possible to suggest site of primary. However, uh, and uh, in the cytology, usually you see malignant cells as multilayered clusters with papillary growth pattern. You can, you can see some of my bodies also. And uh, we use uh, nuclear, we note the nuclear abnormalities, uh, the presence of 3D clusters, if cytoplasmic black holes are present, they indicate new cell and uh, prominent nucleoli. Now, this is an interesting cytologic finding. It is mentioned in the in the literature, but I have never used it uh, or I have not come across this uh, problem. More than one sex chromatin is believed to be diagnostic of breast cancer metastasis. Also, what we call target cells, that is mucus black hole with the eosinophilic inclusions, are also diagnostic of breast cancer in cytology. Now, adenocarcinoma is the most common cell type in malignant pleural fusion. Papillary and gland formations and some of the bodies seen in serous ovarian cancer. And large cell and hybrid small cell lymphomas can be recognized in cytology. It may be difficult to separate reactive mesothelial cells from adenocarcinoma, then which will require confirmation with ancillary studies on cell blocks or based on laparoscopic and or pleuroscopic biopsies. This is a picture of uh, mesothelial cells, a collection of mesothelial cells. 
you see the arrangement. The arrangement is a flat sheet, and there are gaps between the yeah, cells. Uh, these are called cytoplasmic windows, and this uh, results because they have long microvilli on the surface of the cell, and uh, we call it as a fuzzy border. I don't know if you can see some of these uh, almost hair-like thing, which is uh, bridging between the two cells. So this is a feature which is noted in both benign and malignant cells because uh, we use the other features. Basically, in cytology, we use more nuclear features than the cytoplasmic features. In here, you can see that the nuclei are very uniform and uh, in most cells, they are nuclear centrally placed. Uh, so the placement of the nucleus also becomes uh, important because in columnar cells, you find that the nuclei are usually uh, eccentrically placed. Now, as far as the diagnosis of mesothelioma is concerned, the smears are far more cellular and uh, we recognize it as mesothelial because of the windows. And uh, But they, when they are, if instead of being black, the mesothelioma, they have, uh, they have knobby cell contours and uh, fuzzy brush borders, bi and multinucleation and also what is called cell-in-cell uh, -cell configuration. Uh, ancillary studies uh, in problem cases, and these are the common mesothelioma markers, calcretinin, mesothelin, D240, and uh, keratin 5-6. So this can be used. The most important thing is to decide whether it is benign or malignant, and if it is malignant, is it an adenocarcinoma or a mesothelioma? This is a picture of a mesothelioma, plural mesothelioma. You, you can see that uh, the arrangement is different. They, there's some knobby contours here and uh, nuclei also vary in size and shapes. Uh, so so for nowadays, you know, more, more of uh, this, uh, these pulmonologists are now into doing chloroscopy and uh, biopsies, etc. So, we get material for ancillary studies also. This is an example of a serous adenocarcinoma of the ovary. You can see this papillary cluster. And uh, uh, we normally see, and it's a tight cluster. Usually at the periphery, we see what is called crescentic nuclei. And uh, sometimes you may be able to see samomobolis and you know the hemorrhagic background. Now we come to fine needle aspiration cytology. Uh, the history goes back to Karolinska Institute in Sweden in the 1970s for popularizing this technique. And uh, in India, it was uh, P.J. Chandigarh. And, uh, Dr. Subhash, she was the head of uh, uh, pathology in uh, Chandigarh. And she was the one who really brought this into, uh, into India. That was in the 80s. And I stepped in in the late 80s because uh, the uh, clinic, clinicians, you know, uh, they are they keep traveling everywhere, and so they come to know uh, what is happening in the field, and uh, uh, and they found that the pathologists were not giving adequate support as far as cytology is concerned, and uh, therefore, you see, uh, uh, in my case, I was a very junior. Uh, pathologist, so they thought if I make mistakes also, it's all right. So they made me in charge of the cytology. But I got to hook on to it. And then uh, we presented our experience in the initial thousand uh, cases. And we said that we won't take any action based on the results because we were not comfortable. And then when we analyzed the results, uh, we realized that we were not doing badly. So slowly confidence was built up over a period of time. And then other other colleagues also started reporting. And so now it's a very busy, uh, busy setup with almost 40 to 50 aspirates daily uh, from various sites. Now, the, uh, then you see, as I said, I got interested and then I uh, did a uh, fellows, uh, clinical observership at the Memorial Stone Catering Cancer Center, which, is, which was the uh, place where all this started. And including George Papanikolo, he was there in the memorial at the time. Not at, at the time I went. Um, 
and the, the classic treatise on cytology by Leopold Koss, that is considered to be a reference book for all cytologists, that also came from there. So I had the privilege of uh, spending some time there and uh, I felt confident. But the material was available because, but, you know, to develop confidence, you require uh, some hand-holding. So it is uh, suitable for palpable masses as an outpatient procedure. Deep-seated intra-abdominal masses may also uh, may require imaging guidance. It can be performed intraoperatively. If you are a good cytopathologist, it, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, very, very useful. And uh, the most common sites are breast, thyroid, salivary glands, lymph nodes, soft tissue tumors, etc. And uh, how do you assess adequacy? If you are doing the procedure and you make the smear, you just look at the glass slides and if you see particulate matter, you know that you are in the lesion and uh, this material will be smeared. Now, technical aspects, I mean, most of you may be doing it. Uh, so, these are the various, uh, we use disposable needles of varying gauges and lengths and uh, ranging from 21 to 26 needle selections based on location, size, consistency of target lesion. You use a small caliber if it's a, you suspect a vascular lesion and a larger caliber for cystic lesions. And the lengths can be anywhere from 2.5 centimeters to 17 centimeters. And we use uh, disposable plastic syringes. Syringe, uh, syringe holder is, uh, that is the Franzen syringe holder is optional. You can also use a non-aspiration technique where you just only use the needle and, uh, and pass it uh, in different directions and then you take it out and then you blow the material with the help of the syringe on a, on a slide and make smear. Now this is a paraphernalia for the, for the aspiration, fine needle aspiration procedure. You can see this is the Franzen handle and this is the syringe uh, with the needle attached and then you have slides, cover slip, fixatives uh, and etc. Now this is the uh, picture of uh, fine needle aspiration under, um, being undertaken and uh, this is for a lymph node in the neck and uh, use after aseptic precautions you stretch and fix the swelling to be aspirated and insert the needle to draw the piston so as to create vacuum, usually 2 to 3 ml of air is adequate. Move the needle back and forth in the same plane and stop jabbing when material appears in the hub of the needle. This is a smearing technique. You, you deposit the material on the smear and you put, put another glass and uh, you draw it in the opposite direction. And also you get two smears with the material. You can repeat it if there is a lot of material. You can repeat the procedure and uh, obtain several slides. Now, commonly aspirated site is the thyroid. Most common now is thyroid. Um, I don't know how long that will last because molecular techniques are appearing on the screen, on the scene. Then you have breast, soft tissue, tumors, lymph nodes. These are the common sites for FNAC. Now, I want to spend some time on thyroid because it is most common and used and misused. So you must understand uh, understand before you even order an FNAC on thyroid. Because I used to see that, you know, you say, okay, it's CBC uh, and uh, what do you call it? Hemoglobin, TLC, CBC, uh, hemoglobin, CBC and FNAC. Now you find a swelling and therefore you direct the patient for, for uh, FNAC. No, please don't do that. You just uh, see the most important thing is um, whether the uh, swelling is uh, nodular or semi-swelling. Diffuse or nodular and please do the, of course you do the clinical examination to say whether it is euthyroid, hypo or hyperthyroid, but you also get the biochemical evaluation of thyroid function, whether it is euthyroid, hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. Now, if they are hypo or hyperthyroid, you treat because this, uh, and it, here if it is diffuse or nodular, the nodule is it a single nodule or it is multinodular. Now, if it is a multinodular, 
then you do FNA of any nodule which is larger than 2 cm. Because it is any, any nodule which is less than 2 cm is unlikely to be a, a, a neoplasm. The question is also uh, in multinodular coiter, we know that sometimes the multinodular coiter can become malignant. But in such a case, you don't even know. I have seen people doing FNAC. That is, they already have an established diagnosis of metastatic thyroid carcinoma, say somewhere in the bone or somewhere else. And then when the report goes as metastatic thyroid carcinoma, and they examine the patient and they find a big, huge multinodular point. And then they do FNAC too, to see whether there is a, I mean, it doesn't serve any purpose. You know that it is definitely metastatic from, because it's not difficult to recognize the, uh, and usually it is a follicular carcinoma of thyroid. And it is very straightforward to recognize it in uh, biopsies. So there is no point in doing it uh, if in a metastatic situation. But if you have a multinodular goiter and there is a dominant uh, nodule which is very large, uh, then you can uh, do under ultrasound gui guidance. Now, as far as uh, diffuse uh, goiter is concerned, it's usually seen in uh, in hypothyroid states like uh, Hashimoto's. And sometimes the Hashimoto can also be nodular and that nodule is composed of, it's usually a herthral cell nodule. This can be very difficult and uh, unnecessary thyroidectomy can be avoided uh, if you keep, keep these, uh, these uh, points in mind. And uh, the most commonly misdiagnosed uh, thyroid aspirate is uh, Hashimoto's thyroid because cytologic HPLs uh, is common in endocrine tumors and specifically in Hashimoto's thyroiditis where the herthal cells can show features of uh, papillary nuclear features. So it is really problematic. So if you want to help your pathologist, use this procedure uh, with full knowledge of the consequences of the, of the results. So uh, therefore, ideally, it is solitary euthyroid nodule which is ideally suited for FNA. If I can, if I can even just emphasize this, because I never report an FNAC without asking for uh, ultrasound findings and also the thyroid function test, and that has uh, you know led me to avoid a number of pitfalls, uh, which uh, which people who do not take this precaution end up doing and. Uh, creating problem for both the patient and for the surgeon. So please remember this, that FNA of thyroid is ideally suited in this situation where you have a solitary euthyroid nodule. Anything which is hypo or hypothyroid, please treat. Now cyst aspiration, there is another point as well as cyst is concerned. If you aspirate a cyst uh, and, uh, and it will usually, you know, uh, we say contents of a benign thyroid cyst, but on ultrasound, your radiologist colleague, or if you are doing it, if there is any residual mass, uh, then it's better to aspirate that residual mass because many papillary carcinomas are cystic. So this is the important thing as far as thyroid is concerned. And I'm emphasizing again and again because thyroid is the one of the most common sites of finding the aspiration uh, cytology. Now, and I always look at the ultrasound and uh, they have categorized also radiologists use this benign low, low cancer risk, high cancer risk and uh, benign lesions for example is a list which they use iso or hyperechogenicity, spongiform appearance, size less than one centimeter, width more than length, hypoechoic halo indicates a capsule, pervinine calcification, comet tail art. So it, it, there is a list of these uh, uh, things which you can easily get it from the internet, I mean, get it from the literature. So these are the features of a low cancer risk, uh, hyperechoic, uh, large pores calcification, except medullary carcinoma, peripheral vascularity, no hypervascular center, and a spongy form appearance, common tail shadowing. And this high cancer risk, these features, hypoechoic, micro calcification, central vascularity, irregular margins, incomplete halo, which means that uh, there is penetration of the capsule, tall more than wide, and 
recently documented an enlargement of the node, not node. Not now this is the uh, tyroid system of reporting uh, on imaging. Again, five categories: benign, two is uh, not suspicious, mildly suspicious, uh, moderately suspicious, highly suspicious, and uh, they FNA recommended from mildly suspicious onwards according to nodule size. Now this is the Bethesda system of reporting latest. You have six categories. Number one is non-diagnostic. Then you have benign consistent with the benign follicular nodule. Includes adenomatoid nodule, colloid nodule, consistent with lymphocytic thyroiditis, consistent with the subacute thyroiditis, and other in the proper clinical context. Then you have ATP of undetermined significance or follicular region of undetermined significance. Basically, we do not know uh, which end of the spectrum it is. So in short form, it is called AUS of plus. Then you have follicular neoplasm or suspicious of a follicular neoplasm and specify if it is vertical cell type. Suspicious for malignancy, for papillary, medullary, metastatic carcinoma, lymphoma, that is, uh, that is the uh, fifth category. Then, of course, the last one is a malignant category. This is an example of a colloid nodule. The colloid looks like this. You can see in the background, very pink uh, material. Actually, the nature of colloid also sometimes is very useful. In papillary carcinoma, we see what is called uh, chewing gum colloid. We use the term, you know, pathologists are fond of using uh, terms which is daily uh, uh, Food, food material. So we use all kinds of uh, anchovy saws and those kinds of terms we use. So here for papillary carcinoma, we use the term chewing gum colloid. Now this is a, this is in a nodular goiter where you see abundant colloid, and this is a monolayer sheet of cells with uniform nuclei. You know, you, if you compare the size of one nucleus to the other, they are all very very uniform. And you also see what we say, strip nuclei in the background. So when you see a combination of all these uh, features, you can make a comfortable diagnosis of a nodular goit. And this is category two. Now this is what is AUS plus. I mean, you see that it is very cellular and then you are seeing some micro follicles. There's not much uh, cytological ATPR. So you don't know which side of the fence you should uh, commit yourself. And so these things get uh, classified as uh, AUS plus Bethesda category 3. Now this is a very classical papillary carcinoma. The only pro problem with this uh, is that we have to recognize papillary carcinoma. There are uh, nuclear features which we call papillary nuclear features. And uh, that is sometimes very difficult to, it depends on what kind of stain you use. And uh, Jimsa is better than the other stains, but most people do just PAP and uh, or even only HND. In those cases, the optical nuclear, uh, papillary nuclear features of uh, uh, papillary carcinoma are difficult to identify. But when you have an architecture like this, then you know, instead of we may call this, you know, uh, category five. And uh, if I were there, I would call it even six. But we, we would be comfortable with all features are present. But if some features are present, some not present, then you know, you end up calling it a category 5 instead of category 6. So, but this, this is a very classical papillary carcinoma with uh, hierarchical, what we call hierarchical um, branching pattern. This is the Atesta category 6. The only problem with this is that we have to recognize papillary carcinoma. There are uh, nuclear features which we call papillary nuclear features and uh, that is sometimes very difficult to, 
it depends on what kind of stain you use. And uh, Jimza is uh, better than the other stains, but most people do just PAP and uh, or even only HND. In those cases, the optical nuclear, uh, papillary nuclear features of uh, uh, papillary carcinoma are difficult to identify. But when you have an architecture like this, then you know, instead of we may call this, you know, uh, category five. And uh, if I were there, I would call it even six. But we, we, we would be comfortable with all features are present. But if some features are present, some not present, then you know, you end up calling it a category five instead of category six. So, but this, this is a very classical papillary carcinoma with uh, hierarchical, what we call hierarchical um, branching pattern. And this is the Atesta category 6. Now we come to FNAC of the breast. I think most uh, surgical oncologists have done away with this for uh, reasons that if you have false positives, then you know, it is like the eggs being thrown on the face. So, so it, people have you know, left, uh, and mostly I think uh, the senior oncologists, surgical oncologists are happy with doing needle core biopsies, which itself has a very limited uh, side uh, issues. So, it is a useful tool, uh, especially if it's locally advanced cancer and you just want one chapa, you know, that it is cancer. So, then it may be useful so that you don't uh, inconvenience the patient further. And it can, can provide a diagnosis in both palpable and non-palpable imaging guided patients. And it's useful particularly inflammatory, uh, like if you have a, a granulomatous uh, or fat necrosis and things like that. Inflammatory pathology, uh, uh, tuberculosis, these things, you know, uh, then you don't have to do a biopsy. If a clinician is uh, not suspecting malignancy, uh, then uh, maybe you can just use it. Uh, to provide uh, material for this. Cytology can provide diagnosis in most cases with reasonable accuracy. This is the BIRAD system of reporting of imaging. I won't spend too much time because you people are all aware of this. Again, from 0 to 6, uh, in, uh, you have uh, negative, benign, probably benign, suspicious. Then you have further in this BIRAD score. 4A, 4B, 4C, and uh, by rats 5, highly suggestive of malignancy, and by rats 6, known biopsy proven malignancy. So, as far as the reporting system, this is a recently introduced Yokohama system. Again, basically, it is in the same, uh, same like category 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the first two being benign, last being malignant and in between. This is an aspirate from a, a fibroadenoma. You can see two components. You have these ductal epithelial cells. Many of them have these uh, branching kind of configuration. We use the term, you know, glove on, uh, glove on hand. That is the description they give. And these are what called strip nuclei. These are the strip nuclei of um, Actually, these are myoepithelials. Basically, it's a biphasic lesion, epithelial and myoepithelial. The myometrial cells actually are at the periphery of these clusters and they get stripped off. So, you find them all scattered all over the place. You get also sometimes what we call these stromal fragments. And uh, so, when all the three are present here, it is, a, it is an easy diagnosis. Even in this situation here, when you have benign ductal epithelial cells and these numerous uh, strip nuclei which represent myoepithelial cells, we can make a diagnosis of fibroadenoma, which is one of the which, of course, you may not need also FNAC because clinically, if they, it is a mouse in the breast, you know what it is. In contrast, you see these carcinoma cells, you can see my enlargement nucleoli, and this is the GIMSA preparation. The GIMSA preparation looks this is the color of the GIMSA preparation, and this is the uh, PAP slides. The chromatin details are usually better seen in PAP uh, compared to the GIMSA. GIMSA is usually preferred for hematologic neoplasms. And, um, but still, you may be uh, this uh, in papillary carcinoma of the thyroid, you will find these intranuclear holes 
um, and these longitudinal groups, etc., are better seen in genes also. So that is a challenge because if you have a setup only for doing HND and PAP and you don't have a risk for it, genes are then again, uh, there may be a difficulty. Now I come to efficacy of salivary glands. Uh, it is an established procedure for salivary gland lesion because it is rapid and easy to perform, often in an outpatient setting, minimally invasive, safe, inexpensive. It is commonly used in conjunction with both clinical and radiological findings in the initial evaluation of most masses in the major as well as the minor salivary glands before any surgical intervention. Now, what are the challenges? Because uh, it is very challenging because of the diversity of both benign and malignant salivary gland tumors with 34 distinct epithelial tumor subtypes recognized by the WHO. The morphological overlap between benign and low-grade malignant salivary gland tumors, the wide spectrum and morphological heterogeneity of cellular elements within the same salivary gland tumor. The rarity of many salivary gland tumors making it difficult uh, for the practicing cytopathologist to become familiar with their cytological features. The sensitivity and specificity of FNA in differentiating between non-neoplastic and neoplastic is 96% and 98% in the literature. Now, what are the issues in salivary gland FNAs? One of the things is whether it is major or minor salivary gland, whether it is uni or bilateral. On morphology, they are what they are basaloid, oncocytoid, or clear cell. Is it something low grade or high grade? Whether it is biphasic or monophasic. Now, when we consider most tumors in major glands are benign. Why? This is, this is again a general thing. Most uh, tumors in major are benign, while in minor are malignant. And as far as bilaterality is concerned, the classical bilateral one is a Wilms tumor of the parotid gland. Although in my long experience, I have seen only single mucobramal tumor being bilateral. I think uh, Dr. Somshekhan may remember this case. Uh, he, he was a patient from HAL and uh, on whom he operated. And uh, this patient had uh, a, a surgery done on one side and later on he had a swelling on the other side. And it was, uh, it, the original one was mucopodermal tumor. And this one, actually, the material was very scanty. And uh, there were very few cells. But uh, I, I was comfortable because there were the, in mucopodermal tumor, we see mucous cells, intermediate cells, squamous cells, etc. So on the basis of that, but I have not really come across too many bilateral other tumors. So, if in general, you remember if it is bilateral uh, and uh, radiological features are not looking malignant and uh, uh, should remember this, that, uh, that uh, it may be a Wilms tumor. Now, uh, what, what I mean by biphasic or monophasic, again here you see what uh, salivary gland is also similar to breast. So, you have epithelial and myopithelial cells. And uh, they have various, uh, therefore, when we say monophasic means the tumor is either arising from the epithelial cells or myopithelial cells. So you have, you know, drug carcinoma and things like that. Whereas uh, myopithelial cells, you know, myopithelioma, uh, which again can be benign or malignant. So the term biophasic means the tumor has got both cellular elements, whereas monophasic means it's either either one or the other. So, as I said, most tumors in major are benign, while in minor are malignant. There has been an attempt now, you know, to, to the approach to the cytology smears in salivary gland neoplasm. And uh, this is the uh, Milan system for reporting of salivary gland. This is the approach. Uh, you can see that the smear may have this, what we call cellular basaloid neoplasm with fibrillary stroma. So, in this, these are all cellular basaloid neoplasms with varying types of stroma. This is fibrillary stroma, highline stroma, mixed or other stroma, scant or no stroma. But you can see on the right side, 
three or four entities come under this psychological picture. So you understand how difficult it is for us to, to pinpoint the exact uh, histologic uh, diagnosis. Therefore, it is, it is important for you to appreciate our difficulty in these kind of situations. Now, then when you have, that was the vaseloid neoplasms. Here it is uh, oncocytoid neoplasms. And again, what, what is the type of background, whether this is cystic, mucinous, blood or non-specific granular paculated cytoplasm, appreciable focal need. When you have appreciable focal uh, nuclear atypia, it goes straight into carcinoma. The salivary duct or high-grade mucopodermal metastatic carcinoma, etc. But uh, I'll see, therefore, three or four, even though you have similar cytology features, the differential diagnosis you see uh, in the same category is uh, more than one. So this is a problem with the salivary gland tumors as well as their cytology is concerned. Uh, this is an example of a pleomorphic endoma. You can see biphasic means this whatever matrix material is there, it is produced by the myoepithelial cells. So it's a biphasic tumor and these are the epithelial cells and uh, this, usually these stripped sort of nuclei, they are the myoepithelial cells and they produce this matrix material. And the pleomorphic adenoma, most of the time we can uh, make a diagnosis. This is a picture of adenoid cystic carcinoma. You can see that there is this ball-like thing. It's called a cylinder. And this is again a matrix material. So this also is a biphasic tumor, it means there is a both epithelial and myoepithelial components in this, but the histologic pattern looks different. But uh, we observe this this kind of, uh, you know, that is why the term cylindroma is used uh, in reference to adenoid cystic carcinoma. And uh, this is the matrix material, which is in the form of a cylinder. So when you see um, head on, then you see like this. And sometimes when you see as a side view, it looks like a cylinder that you can imagine. Now this is Walden's tumor, which is, uh, these are the group of flat of oncocytic type of cells. This is also called papillary cyst adenoma lymphomatosum. And you can see the large number of these uh, cells in the background. And usually it is cystic, chloridy, and sometimes necrotic. And uh, sometimes if there is cytologic ATP due to any reason, this may even be mistakenly called squamous cell carcinoma. This has happened because uh, the secondary inflammation and other things, it uh, alters the morphology. Then, So these are all lymphocytes in the background. And these are what we call oncocytic cells. And so when you see in a cystic tumor presence of oncocytoid cells and lymphocytes, the diagnosis and clinically bilaterality and the site is a parotid tumor. I think it can easily make a diagnosis. Now, this is the Milan system for reporting salivary gland cytopathology. You have non diagnostic, non neoplastic, then you have again ATP of indeterminate significance, and they have mentioned also the risk of malignancy in each category and the management strategies. So, if it is non diagnostic, you have clinical radiology correlation, repeat FNA. If it is non-neoplastic, risk of malignancy is only 10%, clinical follow-up and radiologic correlation, ATP of under, then repeat FNE or surgery. If it is a neoplasm, uh, benign, less than 5% risk of surgery or clinical follow-up, salivary gland neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential, uh, that is uh, again surgery, uh, then suspicious of malignancy and malignant. So, this you can uh, you can also if you put the, uh, if you look up in that system you will get the get the details. Now we come to approach to soft tissue tumors. Uh, the clinician usually uses these uh, I mean the clinical and radiologic. Then we use uh, histomorphologic and cytomorphologic, and then benign versus malignant, low versus great potential line of histogenesis. And finally, molecular or genetic testing. Now, cytomorphology groups in general about soft tissue malignancies is spindle cell, round cell, epithelioid, pleomorphic, etc. 
and his two genetic groups, adipocytic means from adipose tissue or fat, fibroblastic, myofibroblastic, fibrohistiocytic, smooth muscle, parasitic, perivascular, skeletal muscle, vascular, chondroosseous, gist, nerve sheath, uncertain differentiation, undifferentiated, unclassified. Now, what is the role of FNDC? It's useful in deep sites, not easily accessible for biopsy. It can provide information about whether the lesion is a neoplasm. If so, it is benign or malignant. And cytomorphologic grouping is possible, but histogenetic grouping may not be possible. It can also provide information on grading. This is a malignant brown cell tumor, finally diagnosed as a rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see these brown cells. Uh, and uh, basically it comes under the category of Ramsel malignant Ramsel tumors. You can see this spindling. This is from a synovial sarcoma. You can see the difference between the uh, previous slide and this. You can see these spindly cells and uh, some matrix material here. This was finally diagnosed as a synovial sarcoma. This is epithelial sarcoma, not a very common entity. And here is pleomorphic sarcoma. Now we come to another common uh, site of aspiration, which is the lymph node. And it is um, particularly cervical lymph node. And uh, on cytology, we can uh, separate reactive from uh, reactive. Uh, we can identify a reactive node by the presence of a polymorphous lymphoid population, including tangible body macrophages in the smears. We can also sometimes appreciate the presence of follicles. And uh, it can provide a reliable diagnosis, particularly TB, and thus avoid excision biopsy and the resultant scarring in the neck. And this is particularly relevant because some of the young patients, particularly females, they, they are... Uh, you know, uh, stuck with the scars in the neck and which attracts attention and it may be uh, not a social, uh, it, it is a social uh, issue. So, uh, you can just do uh, the FNEC and come to a diagnosis and then treat the patient and avoid all these uh, cosmetic issues. <laughs> it is uh, useful also in establishing metastasis to lymph node and particularly the, from the upper aerodigestive tract. And lymphoma, both Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin, can all be diagnosed, but biopsy is necessary for confirmation and further characterization. Flow cytometry can be performed on cytological material in suspected lymphoma. So that is important. Now here is a smear of a reactive node. And what is so the, the arrow shows uh, tangible mac body macrophage. You see these uh, apoptotic bodies, and there's abundant cytoplasm with a central nucleus and uh, this is a feature which is noted in and you can see this polymorphous by polymorphous we mean different morphology I mean some are small some are medium some are large so the population is all mixed up and then you look for follicles and you look for these tangible body macrophages and therefore you can easily make a diagnosis of a reactive node now here is a in contrast you see this is a granulometer lymphagnitis and this is a group of epithelial and see this necrotic background which is caseous necrosis other inflammatory cells are also uh, mixed up in this and uh, this is a fairly easy diagnosis to make this is a metastasis squamous cell carcinoma this is a group of uh, squamous malignant squamous cells you can see even keratinization and uh, you see these very abnormal nuclei this is a diffuse large cell lymphoma, very uniform, very large cells, no cohesion. As I said, in, uh, there is discohesion in carcinoma, but in lymphoma, the cells are totally discohesive. They don't stick to any cell. So that is a useful feature. And uh, in uh, even small cell lymphoma, we can make a diagnosis on cytology. And uh, uh, we look for what we call lymphoglandular bodies. Uh, the background, uh, which is basically stripping of cytoplasm, which is a which is a feature we use in uh, making a diagnosis. Now this is a Hodgkin. Of course, we don't get such classical uh, picture, 
because we have to search and in, the, in that context I also want to say that uh, while screening is important in exploitative cytology, screening is not uh, that important in FNAC because if you are in the lesion, uh, then you should get representative material. So there is no point in screening. Unlike in, for example, if you have a gynecological cytology, uh, you have to keep screening. There is a method of screening which, uh, which uh, the cytologist is trained at. So they will go. Uh, you know, in a particular fashion, so that they don't meet, meet because the malignant cells are mixed up with the uh, normal cells of the uh, of the organ which is uh, which you are studying. So you must know, particularly in gynecology, you must know what are the normal cells of the gynecological tract, and then you look for the abnormal cells. But it is very different in FVC because what you are doing is putting a needle directly into a lesion, either. Uh, by uh, direct vision or with imaging guidance. So, if if it is uh, representative, it should come on the smear. And so, there is not much time wasted in, in screening. And uh, very often, we look for what we call uh, streak. That means, if you have a particulate matter and you are uh, smearing it, then what happens is you see a, uh, something like a streak. So, you know, uh, you know that it is the uh, material which has been obtained and which has been squashed on the smear. So you feel comfortable. Sometimes what happens is, uh, I have had some recent experience uh, with contaminants. You see, we are all human beings, we make mistakes. But uh, certain things you see, especially in the laboratories, if uh, particular uh, glassware is not uh, properly uh, washed or I don't know how, but sometimes you will get up, uh, get contaminants. So recently I had a case uh, of a basal cell carcinoma uh, in the lower back and uh, uh, FNC was done for, uh, in fact, there was a diagnosis of basal cell carcinoma and so I don't actually see any reason why FNA was done. But uh, unfortunately, on one side, you know, uh, and this was a variant of basal cell carcinoma. It was a a glandular variant of basal cell calcium. So when uh, I saw the FNA, in fact, the colleague who referred to me also had seen the cells and uh, I said, why is it looking glandular? Then I thought maybe the histology is also glandular and I had it. And I said, I, how come basal cell calcium is going into the lymph node? I spent quite some time, but I said, in the original is glandular and so this is also glandular. Maybe, you know, some, there are always you know, uh, exceptions to any rule. So, but I had a, I had a feeling that, you know, the, the, the cells were seen, you know, uh, beyond the actual smearing area. Uh, but there were very few cells and uh, really had some what's, uh, cramps in my gut. But uh, I said maybe under the circumstances it is positive and they did the uh, inquiry and known dissection and there, were no, uh, there was no metastasis. Of course, it was a relief for the patient. But as a cytopathologist, uh, I said, how do I get out of the situation? If there are contaminants, what do you do? You know, you have no, this don't happen. I mean, let me assure you that these things don't happen that often. But it may happen. So it is useful to to keep that in mind because we are all human beings and therefore I mean, we do things uh, with the best of our uh, knowledge and uh, then, you know, integrity intact. But uh, despite all this, it may happen once in a while. This is just to, to, to keep because you are young fellows, you know, as I said, when we make mistakes, we become butt of joke for in, in your coffee room. So, uh, please be respectful. <laughs> now, I come to the last uh, slide. Uh, cytology is an efficient tool if used in the proper context. As I said, in the computer language, you say, you know, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So, you can use the same analogy. So, it has to be used in the proper clinical context. Proper adherence to technical aspects of collection, fixation, and staining are necessary to achieve optimal results. And understanding reports is necessary for selecting appropriate treatment. And one thing which I forgot as far as the 
sa uh, thyroid FNAC is concerned, please remember that thyroid FNAC is meant for selecting patients for surgery. Don't think, don't rely on that for a definitive diagnosis. Just remember that if they say, you know, uh, it's benign cortical nerve, then you just don't do any surgery. But if there is either uh, three means to observe, four means uh, you uh, take for four, five, six and dollar for surgery. So with this, I conclude my talk. Uh, I invite uh, any comments, questions uh, or from the listeners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranam. That's a fantastic talk. Very, very, very useful. Uh, there will be a lot of questions. Uh, in the want of time, maybe I'll just ask, uh, for the benefit of student, Madam, can you tell where do we use Micra, uh, MCG, uh, stain, and where we would use a pepinicol, uh, uh, you know, uh, hematoxyl neosin stain? Like, where, where is the use of uh, uh, MCG? No, uh, what did you say? M M Micra, uh, yeah, Micra, uh, it's like oh, MGG, MGG, yeah. MGG yeah. stain. Uh, see, the problem is that uh, uh, you realize afterwards, you know, I wish I had an MGG. Because sometimes we, we don't know. Uh, I think thyroid, thyroid, you know, uh, better to do MGG if you are uh, trying to uh, establish neoplastic. Uh, uh, it was, as I said, solitary thyroid, thyroid, new thyroid patient. You can uh, say, because in the papillary carcinoma features are much better seen in uh, MGG. So this is for thyroid. And MGG used if in, in cases suspected of lymphoma. So it's, it's easy. For example, if you do uh, aspirate and then you come with a diagnosis of lymphoma, you can repeat it and uh, do MGG as well. as Because this is the advantage of it is you can always repeat it. You know? uh, so then you use the MGG and then you go for flow and things like that. Thank you, madam. Uh, Saumya has asked a question. In cytology, is there a critical volume of fluid like 1 ml, 2 ml or a quality of cells is adequate? No, as I said, uh, the, see, the question is, it is not the quantity of the fluid which is important, whether the representative cells are there or not. This is the problem. Well, the quality of the cell is more important. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. See, if the cells have shed into the fluid which you have aspirated, then, you know, if the cells are few, when you centrifuge or cytocentrifuge, you can recover. But uh, the, even in 2 ml, you can make a diagnosis. Or sometimes you uh, aspirate the whole thing and put it in a container and not. I mean, uh, so as I said, the sensitivity is very low. T-percent is the sensitivity. Whatever you do, T-percent is the sensitivity. Thank you, madam. All good things have to come to an end. Uh, fantastic talk. Very useful. Thank you very much, madam. And uh, on behalf of uh, NB, uh, MS and then DNB board and myself, student, I heartily thanks for the effort. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, look forward to more interactions. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Over to you, Nauli Singh. Uh, excellent uh, presentation, uh, Professor Dr. Shanta uh, Krishnamurthy. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. And thank you very much, uh, Professor.